party started. All right. <laughs> Let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody. This is the last Wednesday night in our clinic until uh, we maybe start them up again in, uh, in this fall. Um, we have a great presenter tonight. Welcome, Gavin. He's going to talk to us about ocean racing, Vic Maui, and Race to Alaska. And um, I'm going to hand the floor over to him. Oh, thank you very much, Steph. Thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here for the last talk. And I even have a nice working computer thanks to our friend Alex. So this is good. Uh, so now you get to see some pictures, which before you weren't. So welcome all. And we'll start talking about uh, Vic Maui first. And please ask questions along the way. There's tons of photos and little tidbits. I'll try to go over, uh, I mean, the racing, some prep and what went into all these events. Um, and to start a little bit about myself, I don't know, I've just gone a lot of sailing. It's actually like 96,000 miles offshore now, um, which is pretty crazy. A bunch of started when I was 13 with my dad on the Swan 46 back from Hawaii after Betsy and brother and all those guys kicked butt going to Hawaii. And then uh, a bunch of other really cool multi hulls and mono hulls of all different shapes and sizes. Um, so the Valkyrie program is what we're going to talk about tonight, though, it was the um, TP-52 is an older one. It was 2004 built in New Zealand, and it was there in Anacortes for a while, just sitting as a mothball, as a grave heart, and some Canadians got it and wanted to do some upgrading and some ocean racing. And uh, I started out with them just by doing a delivery. I helped them up to Vancouver and spent a bunch of time up the rig on the way helping with electronics and doing other stuff and they're like hey you should come along and help on the boat and so we did and I mean Jason Rhodes who was one of the owners was a great sailor he was an, a multi-olympian chaser and just a really good overall sailor and a good northwest crew of uh, north sales people from uh, I mean from Canada and from Washington and always a bunch of good hands on board. Um, so practice and lead up, really it was, uh, I don't know, we had less than a year to the lead up to the event. So we were trying to pick our crew as best as we could. And so we had our, uh, usually you sailed with 13 people on board for most local events. And we started with uh, Southern Straits and then like Halibut Bank Round Salt Springs, Swiftsure. There was a number of others like the Round Pedos and just tried to sail the boat as much as possible as well as practice twice a week. So I was driving up to Vancouver multiple times a week. The border was very curious about my intentions when I was crossing the border. <laughs> and I had to start getting creative about that one because they're like, what do you mean you're just sailing sailboats up there? And I'm like, yeah, I'm just getting ready to go somewhere. But luckily I never got arrested on my way across for sailing too much. That was good. Um, yeah, our, our program was a really pretty low budget program. So a lot of people were paying on board. Um, I was one of the lucky ones who was working on the boat. So I never had to pay anything and sometimes got something out of it. Um, but we had to pick everybody because when you're going offshore, you have to be pretty selective, especially when you have a large crew of who's on board because you want everybody to have a good time and like everybody does have a job and has to be really good at what they're doing. Um, and bond well together. So no arguing and working together. So a bunch of these slideshows actually came from a talk a couple of years ago. So we'll just go across them really quick. Um, yeah, practicing boat preps, lots of boat preps. And we just went through all the systems, all of our sails on board, uh, which is cool about the TP-52s is that they all have the same rig um, dimensions because it's a box class rule. So we were able to get sails out of the Mediterranean uh, for really cheap with like three hours on them. So like one grand for a main instead of buying a main for 10 grand. And same with the spinnakers because uh, Jason was a really good coach in the Mediterranean. So we were able to just get good deals on all these used sails. Some of which, I mean, like they're med sails, they're light, lighter in a ways, but I mean, like you take a little time on the table and recut them. And as you can see here, we added a reef point in the main just to meet requirements. We never actually used it all the way there. Um, it was more for looks than anything else, but we also had some points. So the boat, we had to do some modifications before we went because um, she was a little bit bowed down when she was built by 
I think it was more than six millimeters. So they used to carry 800 pounds in the transom to make the boat sit on the lines. Um, so Jason and I thought it would be better to trim the bulb and correct the boat. So we cut off the front of the bulb um, <laughs> using hacks or mainly skill saws, hack saws and some hand tools. And we made ourselves a shed as you can see over here around the cradle. And this is in the middle of winter too, like probably sometime in late December, January. And so we cut off the front of the bulb and we shaved off a bunch. We took off about 800 pounds of lead off the front. And then we added it on the aft trailing end of the bulb and then fared it into the front. So we did these big chunks, um, big chunks at the bottom. You can see in the bottom picture towards the back end, you can see the thickness of the lead. And so we kind of brought them in with a forklift and picked them up and strapped them in place. And uh, before we did that though, we filled it up with epoxy and micro filler uh, glass fibers. And I'll never forget, it was like downpouring and I'm under the keel with my leg bolt or with wrenches driving leg bolts into the bottom of the keel with epoxy dripping my face sitting in a puddle of water with like 800 pounds of lead above my head, just screwing it onto the bottom of the bulb going like, yeah, this is, this is gonna make the boat go fast. Um, <laughs> and then we spent a lot of time just fairing it out. So after you get those on, you just have to refair the entire bulb. And on the front of the bulb, we did a foam cap and then re-glassed it in and fared it in. So it was a really pretty bulb by the time that we went, as well as added stiffeners to the rig. And we had to do a bunch of modification or, uh, just upgrades to the rigging system. So we were able to get some like military surplus uh, SK-98 spectra um, and build our own halyards for a lot reduced price, but you have to milk like all the covers onto it and take a lot of time to make your own gear. Cause you can't just, we weren't just going out and buying all of it. We were making a lot of our own stuff. Hey Gav, what yeah. are gaff battens? Gaff battens? What are gaff battens? Um, yeah. Gaff battens are the, so on the square top mains, you have the big gaff, like on the, for the, oh, okay. yeah. And then there, where those, where those drive into the rig, you actually have to have a backing plate. And, uh, so where okay. we put the reef point, we had to add extra backing plates. Um, gotcha. just in case. So yeah, the big gaff batten was like two inches wide and I mean, I think it was 14 feet long, something like that. Yeah, oops, up there, up in the top corner somewhere. But anyways, um, just to talk about safety, I mean, like you got to have your life raft on board because we ended up going with, uh, what was it, 11 people on board, so quite a few people. So we had to have two life rafts on board. We didn't have any survival suits, but of course, EPIRBs, two EPIRBs, communications, satellite stuff, water and ditch bags for each unit. Um, just a lot of gear to make sure and sinking procedures. We had to practice all that before we go up because uh, Vic Maui is a, a category four offshore race. So you have to have a lot more requirements than doing pack up or trans pack um, and carry a lot of extra weight because the water is a bit colder. Um, and just everybody had to be practiced and know their job in case something bad happened because there is a lot of debris floating around in the ocean these days that you have to look out. Um, this is kind of pretty similar to our emergency rudder. We didn't have the cool fold-out tiller, but um, we did have a drop-in cassette, which was the best because when you're actually going, it's easier to drop drop the foil into a box instead of try to line up pins and stuff. The first met, the first one was funny because we didn't put a good enough uh, backing plate on the back side of the transom, and, the, and that boat was, there's a lot of honeycomb bulkheads. <laughs> And we almost ripped the transom because we went to turn and the whole backing plate almost ripped out. So we had to do a ton of laminating in the back um, to make the rudder actually stout enough to be able to drive the boat underway. And we used, uh, we got a flying tiger rudder for our backup and that worked pretty well with the cassette. Um, so the lead up, yeah, so you got to do all the measurements and now we're getting close to the event lucky thing about doing Vic Maui being a Northwester is you don't have to, you just have to go to Victoria. So it's just like starting your Swifter. Um, so yeah, you got your measurement for your, making your, uh, your rating rules and all that proper. Um, 
our rating was a bit faster than the other 52. We owed them a ton of time because they had spent a ton of money on having the proper side sales to the ratings made. Um, and then we spent a lot of time on our food and equipment because like food moves armies. And we ended up doing a freeze, freeze food hide taco. Puppy. Um, That's anyways. so Evie. eating. Yeah, we got to eat a lot. Um, and then figuring out like how, because I brought the boat there and back again. So I had to figure out the crew for coming home as well as like making sure everybody, because I was at this point, I was um, the skipper on board because I had the most time offshore. I had to be um, just organizing everything with Jason, like Jason and I were co-skippers, but he had never done offshore races. So for insurance purposes, I had full coverage for the entire boat and just made, had to make sure all the systems and everything were satisfactory and working for the boat as well as for the crew and everything so i mean it was a lot of work coming into this race um yeah projects list everybody you have to delegate to because there's too many projects for one person to do um, and everybody has to carry a bit of weight um so yeah water just in preparation just want to talk about that because i know some people are going offshore soon so three liters water per person per day uh plus another liter of water for emergency water. Um, that's four liters per person per day. So it's 2.2 pounds per liter. So it's 8.8 .8 pounds per person per day, which is an amazing amount of weight. And then we were planning on a 14 day crossing because normally it's a kind of a longer um, possible race. So, I mean, you're at 123 pounds with 11 people, that's 1,355 pounds. Um, which is a ton of weight. And so you got to put it where it matters. So we had water tanks in the, in the, under the seats. Literally almost a ton. And under, in bulkheads. We didn't go, we didn't go uh, water maker because at this point of the race, you had to carry so much emergency water. Even if you had to have a, a water maker, it wasn't worth the weight and the cost. And we ended up actually throwing a lot of water overboard because we were almost half the time period that we thought. So when we got close to Hawaii and knew that we weren't, that we didn't need anymore, we just started pouring water overboard as quickly as we could. Um, Cause we had water <laughs> deck and we had water jets down below. We had water everywhere. Uh, but make it biggest thing is like, make the water easy to get. If it's hard to get, people get dehydrated and dehydration causes a lot of problems on board and bring electrolytes and, uh, sport additives because sometimes the water starts to taste funny so you want to have like something that makes the water taste better so you'll actually taste it and drink it um, um, and then the food so yeah food food moves armies um, this is a great shot from uh right when we left we're just outside uh cape flattery this was the first day was uh we can see us in the background actually this is kinetic the other tp52 with the whale right behind um super calm the first day but uh so we were eating freezer food so we had had this food made and we built our own uh, uh coolers at a four inch thick foam uh like fiberglass sided foam and it was incredible because at 10 days in hawaii we were still eating frozen food out of the boxes we had like duct taped them closed but it was solidly frozen food and it was really good like broccoli and cheese and and rice and I don't know steaks and noodles and whatever you could think of were in those freezer bags and then breakfast and breakfast was usually oats and then he had a lot of snacks of other oats and um, just cookie bars and stuff and a lot of good food to be had if you could actually have time to eat it was the other hard part so there was a couple designated cooks on board um, and when they had time they would cook something up for the watch system um, and every ounce counts. So the lighter the boat, the faster it is. Um, make sacrifices, but not for safety. Check and recheck all your stuff. Um, so the start, yeah, after we did everything, it was start, it was light, kind of windy at the beginning. This is a uh, longboard. There's kinetic down to leeward. Um, off we go towards, towards the, uh, for the 2400 nautical mile race to Hawaii. And it's pretty much a swisher for the first, all the way to Cape Flattery. And then there's a slight difference. Instead of going to the banks, you turn left and you uh, hopefully get to put the 
kite up, but we, we did that for many hours sitting and drifting and you're like, what's going to be forever to go to Hawaii. Um, <laughs> so, and every day is different. So you just got to get in front and extend your lead. Let's see, I'll go forward and back um, and just talk about the race a little bit. So after the beginning, the first night, um, it actually got really windy. So there was a hurricane in the south and there was a bunch of other weather systems. So we ended up having this freight train of a weather system going all the way to Hawaii. And the first night it was blowing 35 to 40, um, pretty steady, but we were like A, um, we were between the A4 and the A6 up all night and probably doing a steady 18 to, to 22 knots all night long. Um, wow. Yeah, just ripping, ripping. And it was like that most of the way to Hawaii because it was just fast, but it was super windy and um, into the next day. It was just by that point, it was really big weather. And the next, the first day we had actually broke a masthead halyard because we were running on the A6 and broke a masthead halyard. So we went to the fractional kite. Um, and then I went up the rig and at this point it's blowing like 35 and we're in like 20 footers and go up to the top of the 90 foot rig and uh, drop a drop a line down the rig. And it, this <laughs> this activity had taken me like four hours at the dock to do with the jib ones because there's two bulkheads in the rig, and but luckily the line just went straight through, straight down the rig and through the holes on the first go, and it only took a couple minutes to get the new halyard strung. Um, wow! Wow! I know it was so lucky, <laughs> and so we got the rig back up. But at this point, our competition crossfire had already blown up both of their masthead spinnaker halyards and they had broken their third fractional halyard and so they turned around because it was still blowing a steady 35 to 40 and on their way home um, they broke their head stay so I mean the funny I'm glad they made it home safe but the funny thing was was that we were tearing the boat apart until the last minute in Victoria and like re-putting it back together and Crossfire had been sitting and drinking hard and beat us and, yep. and uh, sitting in the cockpit drinking margaritas not worried about anything and they're like, yeah, we're ready to go, but they had immediate breakages and were dropped out super early. So I mean, like, never underestimate your what could go wrong on the boat and just check it, put your hands on it, make sure it all works. Um, and then as we continued south, the breeze continued and we were peeling kites. I mean, like peeling kites like up to 16 times a day sometimes. And we're wow. getting, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Cause we were having big squalls come through and and I mean, it would go from pretty steady 25 to 30 up to 45, 50. And when it was blowing 50, I mean, we we're still flying the A4 or what was that? A5, I guess, at that point. And even the A7 when it was really windy um, and doing, I don't know, 20, 20, up to 28 knots, I think was our top speed or 30 knots on some waves. Um, just ripping along. And then we had times when it was a little bit settled down, but usually at night, um, there was only a couple of us could drive. It was, it was me and Jason could really drive and then like, uh, Rob Wisms. But there was a couple of times when I ended up driving for more than four and a half hours straight because nobody else could see. And you're going like 28, <laughs> 25 to 28 knots and you're just plunging down these waves and they're huge. Cause you're surfing down them. Like it was a pretty wild, pretty wild trip. Um, cause suddenly we we're also realizing that we're going to be there in eight days instead of 14 days and that we're up front because we're also pushing really hard. And at night we were sailing um, without slowing down a lot when we knew the other boat would. So there was a couple of times on Kinetic that we made more than 80 mile gains on them in a, in a night, just because we kept the kites up and kept pushing throughout the night. And we also had the least amount of breakages for the whole fleet, which was pretty cool. Um, so what are the days like? So yeah, we had 16. 16 sail changes was the moat you had to check or you also had to go through the boat all the time so like the boat was taking on enormous amount of water just through the hatches and through the through the um sail changes so you had to always be bailing and like going into the bow because there was water coming out of hatches and um checking all your stays and i mean at one point we were rebuilding sheets uh up to three times a day just because stuff was chafing on chafing on the boom or chafing on something rather. So we had an extra sheet on the spinnaker all the time and we would just switch them and just splice them as you went. And same with the halyards. So after that one halyard broke, we were 
switching halyards. And since we were doing so many sail changes, we ended up making a spare spinnaker halyard ends. And we're just switching out the spinnaker halyard ends every time they look bad. And at one of one of our chafe gears on the uh, spinnaker halyard, I think we had eight layers of chafe gear on it. We just kept putting on more like Cuban fiber. We were even taping Cuban fiber onto onto the halyard chafe gears inside of the spectra covers and putting like four <laughs> covers on top of it, like as much chafe gear as you could. <laughs> and these lines were ending up like an inch thick and barely able to fit in the shifts, but at least they weren't chafing anymore. Um, and then, yeah, sleep maybe, I don't know. I didn't sleep a lot. Couple One time I was awake for 32 hours um, with like a 20 minute nap and just pushing hard on the boat. And some people were on deck more than others. And it was pretty, that was kind of tricky. I mean, we had a watch system where we were three, two, three team systems. So there was uh, our watch, which was, Rob, mm -hmm. Gordo, and myself, and then there was the other one, which was, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember their names right now, but all of their names, because um, then we had, I mean, we had 11 people total, so then we had a couple other groups of two people who would switch on deck in between, so we had our primary um, three on deck, and then you had a rotating two, so there was always five people on deck, um, and we got to the point where we could peel, peel and change kites with just the five people on deck without doing doing calls um, because you just didn't want to wake up everybody because that was harder than actually just doing the sail change. And so, <laughs> it's just like, make, yeah, Rob. I have a question. Um, back to that picture with all the sails in the cockpit, like your yeah. crew looks like sails or where, where does, what's up with that? Why, oh. why are the sails? So we cockpit? had, um, I mean, part of that was that those were the kites that were probably ready to get used. Um, and also that we were trying to, we were kind of had the gangster lean going. So we had all the stacks of sails either in the back or on the weather side down below or in the middle. Um, but we always had usually four kites that we would use because we were doing, like I said, 16 sail chances, but it was just to get the bow up even more. Cause I mean, like if we didn't have the weight in the back, the bow was just plunging. Mm. Um, but yeah, readily accessible and then just wait in the back. And we didn't have enough room down below to fit all the sails because I think we had, I mean, like eight kites or something like that, um, which we used every single one of them and didn't blow up any of them. So that was good. Hey, Gavin. Yep. Yeah, Ben McLeod here. Um, how did you keep your batteries charged? Oh, um, so you can kind of see in this photo too, a little solar panel. Um, so we had two 200 watt solar panels, and then we also had uh, the diesel generator, or the main motor. Um, so we'd fire up the main motor like an hour every day. Okay. And that was enough. Like we had a pretty simple battery, I mean, a, a electronic system, like all we had was a navigation laptop. Yeah. As well as a Iridium Go for our right. satellite communications. Right. Didn't always work. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. And it was pretty simple tactics for this race just because the way that the weather was going like it was kind of a rum line race so you just pointed straight at hawaii and went as fast as you could yeah. and when, we, when we had to jibe you could tell because the you got close to the high and the, you went from going steady like 15 knots to going 10 and just got a little bit lighter and the water looked different and you're like we think we should jive and then we jived and we're within an hour we're going 16 plus again and you're like, yeah oh, that's a good time to jive and how much uh, fuel did you carry? Um, 40 gallons or something like that. Okay. I was going to make a, a point uh, when you talked about water makers before. The water maker is actually a fuel hog. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. He uses a lot of fuel. So, yeah. That so, was the other thing. It was heavy, heavy and power consumptive. Yeah. So by the end right. of the time, we figured out that it was a short enough race that you. I mean, we didn't, we wanted to spend the money somewhere else too. So it was like, let's just save the money and save the weight. Yeah. Um, Cause you would have had the weight and the fuel. <laughs> yeah. Weight and the fuel. So you might as well keep it light. Right. Um, good, good decision. Yeah. And uh, so to keep, keep big rules on the long distances is uh, I don't know, keep, keep the morale up. So make sure everybody's um, healthy and happy and going along pretty good and having a good, having a good time 
um, keep a routine. So keep to your watch system, which was hard. I mean, I don't know. We had a lot of, we actually had a lot of problems because um, there was a couple of times when the other watch was like 40 minutes late to watch, even though you went down and woke them up. And well, they were only there were some people who also had like lied about their health issues. Like there was one guy who had bipolarism and he had lied about that. And then he stopped taking his drugs and I had to take over his watch. And he was also the biggest dude on the boat. And you're like, I hope he doesn't go crazy. And then the, the, Emily, the really sweet little Irish doctor, she was like, don't worry about him. He, I, have, I have drugs to cover that. And it was just a couple <laughs> of unknowns that were a little bit bothersome, though, that were people who had kind of covered up. I mean, really, if we weren't going paid, I would have said we would have just gone eight people would have been great. But I mean, it's like a $50,000 program to go to Hawaii. So you got to come up with the money somewhere. Um, and yeah. So keep your routine though and keep a good thing. And also, have you ever been so wet? So when you're going really fast, these aren't even the wet pictures, but down below, it was literally raining all the time under the winches and under everything. So like the main primary winches were like a river and all your clothing was wet and down below is wet because there's kites coming down below and your sleeping bags getting wet and suddenly you're, everything's wet. So you just kind of got to be used to getting to be a fish and, um, I don't know, saltwater itchy bum is all real. Um, Mid-ocean repairs, though, so yeah, we did a lot of splicing along the way. And checking rudders, you got to go check the rudders all the time and make sure you don't have anything stuck on them. We didn't have, we didn't, we got lucky. We only had a little bag stuck on the keel once, but it came off. Um, we did have to drop the main, like, halfway there because um, one of the, the gaff battens started to break through the front of the sail and so we dropped it and moved the batten and within an hour had the main back up but it was kind of funny even with just the staysail up we we're still doing eight and a half knots um, just with the staysail up so and then we went back and we we're in the tropics at that point and it was gorgeous i mean there was a couple times when we were averaging more than 16 knots for the entire 24 7 and was that what is that 400 and Something mild day, isn't it? What is that? Um, 420. Anyways, um, back down. Yeah, we didn't have to back down communication um, and nap. So everybody's got to sleep. That's also why the sails are in the back, Rob, is so you can have a nice couch to hang out on and to nap <laughs> on. Like it's like a giant bean bag. I mean, that's pretty enjoyable. Um, but yeah, the last couple days were pretty ripping. Like we were having a great time. I had, I had actually hurt my hand um, just from doing too much on the boat. I had tore a small ligament in my hand, but I was still using it. Um, it's a little bit silly, but you got to keep going. So, but there we are. I like that shot when we're ripping in the top left. That's a good one. I think we're doing like 20 knots and we're in the front of a squall pretty soon. Or actually, probably before our squall shot, but coming into Hawaii. We did have um, one crazy squall towards the beginning probably like day three or something like that it was early morning and so the squalls do i have a squall no i don't have a squall one but um the squalls you can tell what the pressure is going to be like from the per first pop is usually what you can tell so in the northern part they're cold big puffs and if your first puff is 50 knots, then the whole puff, the whole squall is probably not going to be less than 50 knots. So if that's your first puff, you know to drop sails super quickly. So we had this one squall probably at like five o'clock in the morning at dawn patrol, and the first puff was 50 knots, and then a lightning bolt dropped. <laughs> oh, this was day four. This is when we went through the um, we went through a, 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 a tropical depression. And so, yeah, we had a big lightning bolt and it started blowing 50. And so we took the 50 plus and we took the kite down. We just had the full main and a J2 up and we're doing pretty steady 22 to 25 just with the J2 and main up. And then we ended up um, just sailing like that for almost a day because we ended up jib reaching for that entire day because the wind went super forward. And we weren't able to put up a A3 until later. It dropped in pressure and we were able to put up a masthead A3 and then 
tight reach on that. The pressure dropped and um, dropped down to a lot less, probably more like 20 knots by the end of the day. Um, but there for most of the day, it was just jib reaching. And we had talked to Kinetic later, and which was the other TP52. And they're like, man, we were like double reefed in the number four up. They were like, man, we were like full main in the J2 up. <laughs> like, you guys are crazy. <laughs> and we even, I mean, we didn't even break anything, which is the crazy part. Um, but cat naps whenever you can. If you're off watch or like there's enough things going on, or you're going slow enough, like have a nap if your crew says it's okay. And, give your crew in a position to do that. So then finally, it was really cold. Normally you're supposed to go to Hawaii, but it wasn't until the last two days that I actually got warm and you got to sail on your t-shirts and your shorts. Um, and there we are coming in, we got the A2 and for the last pretty much four, three days, we just had the A2 with the staysail and a full main going anywhere between 12 and 22 knots for the whole time. Um, we got this one squall coming into Hawaii where we averaged 22 knots for like an hour and a half, just having a great ride. And you could almost see, see Maui at that point. Um, but yeah, it's 24 seven. I mean, like, and you just got to keep pushing the whole time otherwise, otherwise, but yeah, so we came in, um, eight days, nine hours, 52 minutes. And that beat the old record by 18 hours, which was, um, the Santa Cruz 70. Hey Jim, do you remember the name of the Santa Cruz 70? It was a um, was it illusion, Grand Illusion. I thought it was Pie Wacket. No, I think it was Grand Illusion because they brought. I think it was Tom Andrews was there though. I think it was Grand Illusion. It's that Hawaiian guy who has it. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, I could have So we beat the record. We did lose first overall though because we got penalized for uh, not being able to radio communicate for two days because we were having a problem with our radium system. So we lost by 45 minutes on corrected time due to a penalty. Um, even though we had communicated every day through radio transmitter through our competitors who protested us. So that was a little bit sour in the end of it. Um, but we did have great competition and all of us were friends and we, this is our finishing shot coming into uh, into Maui. It's just like right before we came reaching into the finish with a rainbow, of course, because you're in Hawaii. Um, hey Gavin. Yeah. Uh, what did you use for weather updates, live, live or or frequent weather updates? Yeah. So we had. Um, sorry, what's the name? I mean, we had the iridium system, and then we had a. Uh, um, were you downloading grib files? Yes, we were downloading grib files, and it's actually pretty easy. So you have your yeah. your um, command, not commanders, but um. We did use commanders a little bit before you go because everybody can use commanders and you can get a little bit of weather routing before you go. Right. Um, and then we were using. Sailflow? No. Um, what's the really expensive computer software? Expedition. Expedition, yes. We were using Expedition. And so okay. you're able to click and drag over the area that you want to download. So you can download your files in the area that you are and you can do up to. I mean, as far as out as you want, 48 hours, but usually you do multi, multiple um, calls in closer hours for your immediate vicinities and then do a broader forecast for the larger area. And then you on Expedition, you have weather routing software and it, due to your polars, mm -hmm. it will give you a line saying what's your fastest track to your given destination. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, Expedition was a good tool, but like I said, on this trip, it really was pretty self-explanatory just to point straight at Hawaii because the pressure was just taking you there like a freight train. Um, <laughs> the biggest part was just like, don't break your boat. Um, so the other the other 52 broke, um, I mean, we both were carrying about nine sails and I think they broke seven of them. Um, and they also blew up a primary winch um, oh. And the other, the, the, the Santa Cruz 70 um, westerly, they broke their head stay foil completely. So they weren't able to fly any jibs for most of the, I mean, no jibs. Luckily, they didn't break the head stay. And of course, Crossfire broke everything and dropped out early. So we were really happy to have the lowest budget and have no breakages that weren't repairable underway on board, which I thought was a good point. And I 
solid shot here. And a cool trophy. <laughs> oh, there it is. There's the finished trophy. So if you go to Lahaina, you can go have a beer. And Betsy's on there too with the Tranquilite. Um, and then after the finish, we can talk about trip. Any questions about the race though, before I just do a quick talk about sailing home. <laughs> awesome. Is, is that trophy at the Lahaina Yacht Club? Yeah, at the Lahaina Yacht Club. Okay, yeah, I've been there. Nice, nice little club. <laughs> yeah, it is a great club. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when we got there, when we got there though, it was uh, pretty funny because we were just up front of a hurricane. We dodged in up front of uh, uh, Dobby was the name of the hurricane. And this is the chaos that it looks like on the right when your boat gets to Hawaii and you've just been on it for eight days. So there's just clothes and, <laughs> clothes and stale explosion all over the boat. Um, the coolers are on the bottom bottom right corner. Those are the ones that we built. Um, super light, worked really well. And then there we are anchored in Lahaina. So we were there, but then that's when we had the surfboards behind the boat. So we lived in Lahaina for like eight days after the hurricane because we sailed to Oahu. Um, I think it's this picture. So that, there we are hiding in Oahu. We took Piwak at slip. And uh, during the hurricane, we hit out, we went snorkeling for a few days, reloaded the boat, and we sailed back home with five people on board. And we added Hannah Turner was the next person on board. Nice. And Chris, so we came home with six. There was two more that came on board, but yeah. Um, waited for a good weather window. So we had a joke on the way home because we were almost going to leave due to everybody's work schedule, but then it was going to be a uh, like 60 degrees on the nose. So pretty much straight up wind at 30 knots and it sounded horrible. And I forget, I think it was Chris who was like, so you're telling us we could either go on a trip on the Vomit Comet or we could go on a six day Hawaiian vacation and have a pleasant sail. <laughs> <It was like, laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go cruising. So we ended up going cruising uh, around the islands. And the biggest thing is like be friendly to your locals and um, get all your stuff out of the container and just go have some fun with the surfboards on the boat and go snorkeling. And then when you're heading north, unlike going to Hawaii, it gets colder. I mean, you get to throttle back a little bit, but we're still sailing five up. And I mean, we did it really quickly uh, in 10, or was it 10 days, 11 days. I think it was 10 days um, coming home. So we averaged 10 and a half knots for the first five days coming out of Hawaii with like a double reef main and a four up and just cooking along because we were at 90 degrees apparent um, right on the beam, just cooking along. And uh, we had to, we did have a delay because of some hanks that broke in the um, main. So we had to wait for some parts to get shipped to us from my brother, Angus. Um, and then just know all your systems. So we had a little bit more fixing on the way home because the boat was pretty tired at this point. We actually um, lost the port wheel. You can tell that I'm on starboard driving on lured. That's because the port wheel is actually not functioning because the bearings failed on the uh, wheel. Um, and yeah, so have fun. Be careful. The great high is a good fun. Watch out for the whales. The whales almost got us when we got back to Cape Flattery. Um, that was actually one of the most dangerous things was the sleeping whales um, and ships and debris. But there's there's the old Valkyrie back at home. Um, yeah. Gav, is, is Valkyrie missed now? It is missed now. Yeah. Yeah. And they <clears throat> yeah, as you know, they have a new rig because they broke their rig top and they've also done a couple other changes on board. Um, it was yeah, they still got the same keel modification that you did? Yeah, same keel modification, same rudder, all that. So, but yeah, different different rig now. They, they had the, the frac halyard break. They put a flat, frac halyard up or fractional spinnaker on the masthead. And when they broached the, the Thai Alaska shackle, just beat the rig into submission, broke the top off of the rig. Um, well, so unfortunate. So, but any more questions so on the belt? Were, when you were in uh, Maui, because the rig, I mean, your keel is incredibly deep. Um, did you stay out on the Buoy. buoy for a while or yeah we were out on the buoy so we were or LY. yeah we were in um we were in the hawaiian islands for i think 10 days by the time or 14 days by the time we left um 
So when we were in Lahaina, yeah, you cannot go in the harbor because the draft is only, I think, 10 feet in there and we draw 12. So we were out, we were out at the mooring buoys and we had to get a taxi service to come out or like Jimmy and Sam rented surfboards and paddled back and Chris swam to the beach once with his dry bag and, <laughs> and uh, but when the hurricane hit, so we were tied up in Lahaina at the buoy and the hurricane hit and we actually put up the number four and sailed downwind to Oahu because I had arranged a slip at, uh, at the Honolulu Yacht Club. And so we were tied up yeah. at Honolulu Yacht Club for five days. Um, and we took, actually we took Piwak and Slip um, cause they were in, they had just done pack cup and were in the, uh, in the other side, but they got kicked out, but luckily had some space on, in our Harbor when they arrived there. Um, and then we, it was too expensive and the weather, weather was bad. So we tried to go cruising in the, in the Hawaiian islands, which the first place we tried to go on, Molokai, <laughs> we couldn't go into cause it was drawing 10 feet, but it was blowing 50 when we got there. So we couldn't go in there. And then we tried to go to the North side of, um, Lanai and that was that was uh looked like Dr. Evil's lair and not very comfortable so we kept going and then we ended up back in Lahaina and we're like you know this place is actually pretty nice so we just stayed anchored out or just tied to the mooring buoy out there um, for the rest of the stay um, so yeah but yeah it's really hard to cruise a boat with 12 foot draft in Hawaii there's no harbors around so yeah but to enter our second part of the story, because I've heard that you all want to hear two stories from me, which the second one is the R2AK, <laughs> um, which everybody's excited about. Um, so there we were, 2019. This is when, right after the start uh, out of Port Townsend, it was blowing pretty hard. I think I'm driving right there. We got the camp, keel fully canted, pretty big waves and sea. The whole fleet's behind us. Um, yeah, pretty cool shock 40. So here we are, we got our bicycle drives on the back. This is a different type of race. We're going to Alaska, right? It's, uh, um, what is it? 620 miles on the inside passage. You can use bicycle pedals and, uh, whatever other means that you have, you can see down here, we have our, uh, our quality Irwin clamps to keep the, uh, keep the bikes down. <laughs> So our bicycle drives are the biggest part for your uh, R2AK mission because without them, you can't go. So we spent a bit of time on them, um, but we were also late. We were only like four months out on the uh, sign up. So we were one of the last boats allowed in the race. So we made, we took some carbon or took two, two by fours, wrapped them with carbon and mounted these Cannondale bicycles on top of them. And we took a, uh, the lower units off of Ocelot, which had won it uh, two years prior, and then modified the gearing to fit our own bicycles. And they had a tilt drive. You can see the plywood under the um, under the bicycle. So when you wanted to tilt them up, you just pulled off your Irwin blue clamp and tipped them up and put your piece of plywood underneath it. Um, the biggest time that it took was to fit the right propellers for the system. So we first tried like a, a more of a high speed propeller, like an aircraft propeller, but then we found that that was too hard. So we ended up making like a tugboat propeller um, a lot, but it, more like an aircraft, but a really flatter, wider prop that was easier to turn. And then changing the gear ratio on the bicycle to better turn. And I l last minute I brought some oars uh, from a rowboat, from like a, a sweep boat. So with our two people pedaling and two people rowing, we could do three and a half knots to four knots under human power and no winds or water <laughs> with a lot of work and sweat. Um, yeah. Yep. Good, um, you know, get everybody up to speed who doesn't know the race to Alaska. Um, no, there's no motor on board allowed. Um, Correct. Yeah, no motor on board allowed. We didn't even have an outboard hidden on board. There's no motors um at all <laughs> so you're up to your your rowing boats your i mean sailboats is really actually a great race because like everybody has their own built pedal drives and people are rowing boats and and sailing tiny trimarans and doing all sorts of other stuff that you couldn't even imagine 
um, that they would be taking there. So it's, and it's just this really adventurous and spirit too, like compared to kind of R2AK there, I mean, to the Vic Maui, everybody's super serious. You're going offshore to Hawaii, like this R2AK has this really cool adventure spirit to it. Cause you're like going to Alaska and some people know that they aren't even going to make it all the way. They're just there for an adventure. And it's just kind of a fun crowd to be around. Um, and some really competitive people because it's like the top the top teams do spend a ton of time on their bicycle drives and on their sailing and like really want to win because if you do win you get 10 grand cash nailed to a tree which is pretty pretty fun <laughs> and so there we were we had, there's like a, a I don't know 85 boats or something signed up um, and just some fun I think I can slide this over here I got some other pictures let me slide up and or go down just to show what a couple other boats in the fleet look like um, um, yeah so this is the like here's the dragon can everybody nobody can see that okay never mind <laughs> um, it nobody saw the new pictures but so here's here's like our other competition um, on the right. So these guys, this is a Figaro two, and these guys were from MIT, and they could had these sweet fold down <laughs> propeller systems. And under pedal drive, they had two pedalers per propeller. Um, they could do six and a half knots under their personal pedal drives, which was incredible <laughs> because they could do like the same speed as we could with two pedalers super easily um so like a lot of the setup to the race and then there you can see there's a lot of multi hauls and a lot of little boats around um you should really all oh, there's a great movie out about it um and up in the top corner behind the shop ski you can kind of see the whole fleet so in the beginning so you do a race from port townsend to, to victoria we arrived second in victoria behind the the dragon the or paired shape, the trimaran, um, which I should be sailing with this next time around. Um, but so we had a shore support, which was super fun. So you have this uh, uh, um, a group start on the beach. So you can't be on your boat. Your boat has to be tied to the dock, ready to go, nobody on board, and you're all up above this place and they have a big talk and then they blow a cannon and you all run down the dock. And of course, right before we went, uh, Eric Dorman pulls out the shot ski because he has a he has a ski bar up at Crystal and he's like you boys have to take the shot ski and uh, so the whole team takes a shot ski and the horn goes off and we run down the dock and hop on the boat and get on the pedal drive and start <laughs> pedaling out of Victoria Harbor and <laughs> and of course you can't roi sail roi uh, raise the sails until you're out of the harbor and so there's this big race and commotion and of course the coho comes in and messes up the whole start and you got to get off to a side and um, pretty entertaining out of the get-go. Um, so yeah, then going north, this this is actually from farther north up in the Hecate Strait somewhere. It gets, so unlike going to Hawaii, it gets really cold going to Alaska and you got to wear everything that you own, plus like the most waterproof gear that you have because um, it rains more than you could imagine on the way. Actually, I don't have a ton of pictures. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but it's really cool race because you're going up the inside passage. So we're going up the inside passage and you start out by going up the Johnstone Strait and, or not the Johnstone Strait, but up the Straits of Georgia. And that was all like really good sailing. We had a good battle with pear shape this whole time. We kept catching up with them. And there was also the um, Triceratops was the other trimaran that kept catching up with us. So we're pedal driving and sailing all the way up the Straits of Georgia and we ended up pedaling from like Muskegee all the way to Campbell River pretty much so we pedaled for I don't know like 10 hours or something like that and just kept going finally there's breeze but then we're fighting current I, I was the navigator for this trip and I'm like guys I don't think we're going to make the tide at at, at, at Seymour Narrows <laughs> and sure enough we're like getting to Campbell River and the tide starts to change and we ended up battling up current like a salmon and we tied up to this dock um up on uh quadra like right across from campbell river and finding a, a some really nice people came down the dock and loaned us an extension cord and we charged their batteries 
because we had a Canton keel and that runs on electricity. So we had an e-foil e -foil that would also charge our batteries to, so that we could cant the keel along the way. But we ended up doing a lot of manual canting because we weren't sure of the ability of the power charging of the e -foil. So we did end up like just hand pumping and gravity dropping the keel a lot for the whole trip. Um, but after some nice Canadian visits and a little bit of powder, battery charge, we sailed up to the left mouth of the, the Seymour Narrows where the, the tide changed and it's ripping through there at like 14 to 16 knots when it's fully going and it starts to die down. We're tied up to uh, this, this fish net um, having a little bit of a break because we're all pretty fizzled at this point. And then the, the, the dusk is descending and the breeze is starting to build and the tide is dropping and the two trimarans and us drop into the channel and we hear this giant foghorn and here comes the Disney Cruise Line ship down current while we're all sailing into the tiny Seymour Narrows and I'm, I'm driving at this point and pinching up behind the di giant Disney cruise ship and then uh, then we enter the Johnstone Strait for the night and as we get closer to Beaver Point, uh, which was funny because we were on the Angry Beaver team. So we're like, oh, we're at the Beaver Point. This is great. <laughs> and we, but it's getting these big pops up into the 30s. And I mean, that night we had a, it, it was just brutal going down current. We're going down current at like 11 knots over the bottom or more. And it's gusting up to 40 to 50. We had a couple of big willy waws up the mountaintops where you could just hear it. It was, I mean, it was mainly um, Simon, uh, Matt, and I switching off driving. But at this point, I'm like driving and Simon's trimming the main. And it's just darker than dark. And you're sailing just by telltales because there's a 4,000 foot cliff up front of you and it's completely dark. And Matt was looking at the system and he's like, no, man, it's a mile away, but it's just darkness. And you're sailing at it at nine and a half knots boat speed. And we hear this giant just whooshing sound and you could see this curling water over, I mean, just curling white water coming out of the darkness and this big just willy wall hits us. And and I mean, we almost thought they were gonna have to like drop the main and stuff. The other trimaran near us did drop their main and ended up anchoring for a little while, but we made it through the squall and we talked to pear shape later and they didn't even feel the willy wall. So when you're in those giant mountain regions when it's blowing like that, like you never quite know what's gonna fall upon you. But that whole night we're just going 11 to 12 over the bottom down current. And at one point the wind dies and you can just hear this giant waterfall. And uh, we're like, is that the end of the earth? I think it's the end of the earth. And finally you come to this tidal bore and the boat drops a couple feet over this tiny waterfall in the middle channel. and and then by the morning, the wind is gone and you're just pedaling. Like I, I stayed up all night and by the morning, it's like Brent and, <clears throat> Brent and Alan and somebody else pedaling and we're going like three knots over the bottom fighting current. <laughs> you're just like, did that last night really happen? But we saw our competition in the, in the morning and then uh, we're still close. So then we had a beautiful sail up the, um, through the Queen Charlotte Sound um, which we should have a, a race week there sometime. It's better than anywhere else. It was blowing a nice steady 12 to 14 and it was flat water, but with some ocean waves in it. And it was just a really gorgeous place to sail. And it was like, man, we should do Van Isle and come up here and sail a race week um, somewhere else. Uh, and then we ended up pedaling all the way from Cape Caution for probably eight hours or 10 hours or something like that. Um, and just a lot of pedaling the whole race we probably pedaled more than a quarter of the whole race which required like taking off all your foulies because you're getting ready to sweat and we had all been practicing on road bikes before the event and um, just i don't know you just had to keep pedaling otherwise your competition would pedal right past you and everybody was close behind i mean like most competition was less than 15 miles behind for this whole time but we kept battling for first with pear shaped which we thought for sure would win the whole time, but it turns out we were closer competing than we thought. Um, but then we had a great sail downwind uh, up to Bella Bella and we dodged through some tiny rocks. So I was like, hey guys, we can take a shortcut through some tiny rocks. And we took this little channel 
into Bella Bella through the back entrance and caught pear shape once again. But we knew there would be some pressure this coming night when we entered the Hecate Strait. So when we came out into the Hecate Strait, uh, it ended up blowing. I mean, it kept building and building, but we came out close reaching with a reef in the main and the four up and it was blowing a good 35 to 45 with full breakers over the deck by the time that we were coming around the group of islands and the, the I mean, we had full overhead breakers coming into the cockpit and over our heads and we're just like, man, is this really smart? Cause we're out here in this old Canton keel boat and like we've heard about keels falling off on them before and we're just like, huh, I guess we're out here. So we just have to keep going. And at some point I, I had been awake for a long time. So I went down for a little break and you could feel the whole boat bending around you a little bit because it's just a plywood plywood boat and you can watch the bulkheads bend and you're just like, I'm just going to sleep. Luckily we had a heater. We installed a little heater because otherwise at this point it's only like 40 degrees outside and just super cold and uh, blowing really hard. But we put up the, the A7 and then we peeled to the A4, which I think is what we have up in that picture on the left. And we just averaged, we averaged like 14 knots for the whole trip down the Hecate Strait. And it, we had these beautiful jibes, which I wish I could show you that picture of our jibe lines because we got just got giant headers and only jibed four times down the whole straits. And the last jibe we placed like uh, 40 miles out from the finish and just came straight line freight train doing a steady 14 knots into the uh, into the finish, into the finish uh islands which it was just raining for the last two days super hard like alaska style rain like they say it rains hard in alaska and it's totally true it's just downpouring the whole entire time um <laughs> truly raining the whole time um but what else yeah and then we came into the finish and at this point we were really worried about our competition the pear shape because when we came into the hecate straight we thought that it was trimaran flipping conditions so we we're we were worried about our buddies and we hadn't heard from them at all. And we came around the finish corner or where you have the last mile to the finish, you have to come around like there's a split around the island. So we picked going left for better pressure. And we came around the point and we we're getting ready to hoist the kite. And we look back to the right and about a mile off to the right, pear shape had come the other way around the island. And you just saw their little mainsail in the calm pedaling. And instead of hoisting the kite, we knew that we had won. So we, we uh, cracked a beer and cheers. And then pretty soon we had the uh, King Five News out on a, on a boat. <laughs> and it was like the biggest receival that we've ever had. We had the bell, bell ringing with the R2AK uh, six pack or 12 pack ready for us. I mean, they know how to welcome some sailors from four days of uh, four days and three hours of hard sailing. and. So we parked the boat and after the after we got through customs and talking to the news teams and went up and had ourselves, I think it was pretty funny. Brent and I like come into the, there was a fish and chip spot and we're like, hey, could we have six orders of fish and chips? Maybe actually make that 10 orders of fish and chips and four pitchers of beer. And we walked immediately to the wood stove in the back because it was still raining and our clothing was just sopping wet. And we just stripped down to our long johns and hung our valleys next to the fireplace and proceeded to eat our fish and chips and beer. <laughs> uh, and yeah, have a good time. And then we had to welcome all of our competitions. So slowly everybody came in and we only spent two days in Alaska before we turned around and delivered the boat five days home under motor and sail. So we turned and burned immediately afterwards. Um, but yeah, I mean, both, both. yeah, there it is. Um, pretty cool adventures though. The R2AK though, I mean, that was a really special one. I mean, we did a lot of work to get our power systems working and our pedal drives working. And we got lucky with the boat from uh, the Skiff Foundation. So we were able to have a really nice platform with really good sails on board and the buddies on board, I mean, Matt, Simon, Alan, Brent, Mott's, and uh, that was our main crew. And then um, the head 48 North guy came with us from Port Townsend to, to Victoria just to write the article. And it was just a really good crew of people of um, 
young guys who love to go sailing and everybody's building boats brent brent and simon are building riptide 25s and um and matt matt and i are building pro us so yeah pretty good time playing with boats so Hell yeah so what do you do our on the way home, you said you motored home. So did you have a outboard you just stuck on the back or did you oh, put a so back the, in the boat? Yeah, so we put the outboard on a, um, on a barge and it came on a pallet and was in Alaska when we got there. So we had to take our uh, dock cart down and get our outboard and uh, all of our jerry cans. And then there's a, there's a hole in the middle of the boat, an outboard well where the outboard goes. So then we dropped it in there and filled up all the tanks. And actually, it was pretty funny coming home. So we, what was it? We had like 20 or 30 gallons on board. And we're going south. And I mean, I have to be honest, but we had a bit of a party <laughs> when we were in Alaska. And uh, we were only there for two days. So, of course, it was a really good party. And we left. And and uh, we I woke up again somewhere by Prince Rupert. And then it was like, yeah, it was going... <laughs> Going back down the down the sound and or down the inside, fully inside passage this time, not through the heckin' straight. We're going down through um through the the Har was that Harvey Channel? Um, not and, here. Yeah, and we we were going past uh, uh um one little town. It was like no, we all agreed that we had enough fuel to make it past there, and then we we. Turned out we didn't because the tide changed and we're like, oh no, we do not have enough fuel to make it past there. And so I get on the on the radio because I see this big yacht coming and I'm like, hey, big yacht, you're from Seattle Yacht Club. Do you guys have any fuel? And they're like, no, we don't. But uh, have you ever heard of Clem 2? And I'm like, what's Clem 2? They're like, well, it's out, it's 40, it's uh, 30 miles out or something like that. And we can't even find Clem 2 on the chart. <laughs> And so we get closer and we keep looking for it. And I get back on the radio again. And finally, some cruisers like gives me a location for Clem 2. And it's this tiny little town of like 40 people. And we get to Clem 2. And we're waiting at the fuel dock. And some guy is pretty called in. But we have Mots, who's Swedish. We've been joking this whole time that the whole entire coast is just full of bears. and dangerous creatures and he's just like oh my god that's very oh i don't even know about this and and we get to clem too and he's up walking around town and this old native guy who's waiting for fuel is just like oh you better look out for the bears up in clem too right now there's a grizzly bear and a black bear walking around town and they're kind of been a problem so <laughs> we're just like lucky that mott's made it back to town he did see it from a distance but it was pretty funny you could just imagine him being scared from a bear and running back and never getting on land again so <laughs> but then yeah we were matt and simon and i were a little bit bummed on the return trip because uh brent and alan and Mots had to get back to work so we kind of rushed it on the way home and we really wished we had just insisted that they had caught the airplane because it was only like 70 bucks to catch the airplane to go home and we could have spent a couple two weeks cruising on the way home so next time just your crew Crew has to go home, get them an airplane ticket, and it's totally worth it to have the cruise. Because the whole way going north, too, you're going so fast, and all you see is nice sandy beaches and cool little coves that you want to stop in. And meanwhile, you're going 14 knots, having a great sail, but you're also like, oh, it could be pretty nice anchored over there on the sandy beach, uh, or near to it at least. But uh, yeah. So, well, thanks, guys. Um, well, thank you, Gavin. Yeah, thank no problem. God. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, everybody have fun. Any other yeah. questions about some ocean stuff? I want to ask you about you had that one slide up about the squalls and because it's cold and it's warm and oh, right sure. back here. click, click, click somewhere. Yeah, it was way back there, almost there. Yeah, well, if you're going back, if you're going back, I'd love to see that. You had a weather chart up also. Oh, we can go back up too. I don't think that's the actual, but oh yeah, well, I'll go back and talk about actual sailing here for a minute. So yeah, you <laughs> good, uh, some good notes. I mean, just when you're getting ready to, to go offshore, like you want to have your good, um, 
you're good. Navigational systems ready. And you also don't want to be too complicated because I mean, I've had one friends who've won pack cup with almost no information on board because you can take some information the day of when you depart and you can forecast weather forecasts are so good. Now you can be like six days pretty accurate. And at that point you get one more download, but it's an ocean race. So you've already committed <clears throat> to your initial angle. Really it's about staying up front of your competition. Um, but here's just a couple of examples of like some really big systems coming through the North Pacific of big lows and high pressures. Um, I wish it was more to the right. Like this would kind of be, when, when was this? This is a 48 ounce surface. This would be a, it might be a good time to hang out in Hawaii a little bit or have a good downwinder, um, <laughs> bit of a reach, reach and a run back home. Um, is it July? Is it July? Where's the date? Hey, I only have the UTC, it cuts off on the date. I that. This one, this one's though is October, 2017. So you have this really big system and uh, it has wave heights. So there's like some big 17 meter seas. Doesn't look that fun to go to Hawaii. It's pretty calm on your way to Hawaii on this picture. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, the Pacific's pretty kind of volatile, especially nowadays with some climate change, like the highs split a lot more and they move and the trade winds are less strength than they used to be. And you also have these really big pressure systems coming through. So you gotta be a little bit careful and lucky on your your time departures um, but yeah studying studying also um, like if you're getting ready to do pack cup and Vic Maui I would suggest just like there's data on all of the routes that people have taken for almost 20 years and like you can kind of look at all those routes and have a pretty good idea of where you're going to sail your race and then taking your your lead up um, coming into the event a couple weeks out like take your keep downloading weather and um, and like on the 70 like on on the 52 and the 70 like we had a lot of power and we were able to download weather every like four hours um, but really we were more worried about where our competition was a lot of the time like we were leading but it was also about staying in pressure and then just staying up front of your people so if they jibed you jibed type of thing it was like a match race with the kinetic all the way to Hawaii because you were just jive on jive with them and just staying up front and not trying to get separated was the biggest thing. Um, and then pack cup on, on the 70, that was pretty similar. Like we got really up front and, but we had a major breakage. So we had lost a, the second spreader and had to slow down on that trip. So we went from being the front boat to being middle back boat, which was a bit of a bummer. Um, but before that it was about sailing pressure and, also not listening to, we had bad polars. So I was always arguing with the navigator because the polars wanted us to be reaching all the time. So it's more like knowing your boat and how to actually point and pick your own weather and being like, no computer that we should not be sailing at that angle. We should be sailing at this angle and just questioning your systems as well as trusting them if you know they're super accurate because some boats are more accurate than others on their computer software. Um, but I'm more of a, uh, <laughs> what would you say, a, a, a Captain Cook sailor is what my, what Andy would say. So a little bit more simple sail by your seat. Use your use a simple amount of data because the more that you stare at the computer, the less that you're sailing your boat because um, you can play the computer game way too much and you forget to sail your boat. And I think it's really important just to sail your boat and then stay in pressure um, and go as fast as possible. I think would be a big no to that. So don't get lost in your computer programs and just sail fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, good job, Gavin. Uh, yeah, it was Grand Illusion. You took the record away from, I checked. The oh, cool. <laughs> I remembered a name. So thanks, Jim. Yep. Well, thanks, everybody. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Gavin. That was great. Yeah, that was great. Good to see all of you. Hey, good job, Gav. Good ah, thanks, Bob. <laughs> that was awesome, Gavin. Thank you very much. Thanks, no thank problem. You. Yeah, I hope to see you out on the water soon. Next week. Yep, next so week. so reminder, everybody, tune-up racing starts next Wednesday and Fridays. Oh, cool. Rogue Pedos next weekend, yep.
Okay. Good night, all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe. Maybe. Let's go stop recording. Would you like to do last? I'll help you. Mm -hmm.